What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can catch me on Twitter at no more parties and today's video is I don't really know I uh, I started prepping for this video with like a, a take in mind as I researched the video I sort of changed my mind a little bit changed my mind again sort of met myself in the middle but basically I'm talking about Javante Williams, um, his talent, his situation, his dynasty value. What should we be doing with Javante Williams in dynasty? Um, is he a first round pick in single QB? Is he a second round pick in super flex? What should we be doing with Javante Williams? And then I'm also going to touch on Leonard Fournette at the end. So let's get into it. <laughs> Uh, number one, as of April, or really this this offseason, really, um, prior to the NFL draft, Melvin Gordon was a free agent, and the Dynasty community had collectively decided that Melvin Gordon was not going to re-sign with the Broncos, and Javante Williams was going to be... Like, it, it was going to be wheels up for Javante Williams. He was going as the RB2 in a lot of drafts. As of April, before Melvin Gordon re-signed, um, I think this was post-Russell Wilson getting traded to the Broncos, so it was, like, even more wheels up. Like, Melvin Gordon's going to be gone. They just got a huge quarterback upgrade. Like, uh, they got, you know, a new offensive-minded head coach. Um, this was going to be, like... Javante Williams is going to explode in 2022 and going forward. And in April, um, according to DLF, he was going as the RB3 and as the fifth overall player in single QB drafts. And at keep trade cut, he was going as the RB2 and the 12th player overall in super flex. So being taken about as high as, as you could possibly go um, from a guy who's, who split carries last year. Um, and then Melvin Gordon re-signed post-draft, like we're, we're in May now. At DLF, he is currently being taken as the RB5 and the 11th player overall in single QB league. So right there at the end of the first round of the 1-2 turn as the RB5. And at keep trade cut, he's currently being valued still as the RB3 in Superflex and as the 14th player overall. So right there at the 1-2 turn still, he dropped two spots since April, one spot in the running back rankings. So he's still being taken very, very highly. And so... He's an interesting player. Um, lots of people like him. Um, he split carries with Melvin Gordon last year. And so what can we expect from him going forward, like given Melvin Gordon is back, um, given his performance last season, given that Russell Wilson is here? What can we expect from Javante Williams? Um, well, last season, Javante finished as the RB25 in PPR points per game with 12.05 points per game. Melvin Gordon finished as the RB23 in PPR points per game with 12.19. So they were really very equivalent fantasy assets last year. Uh, Melvin Gordon was slightly better, and that's probably largely due to his having a slightly higher opportunity share. Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon last season were probably the purest like one two split in a backfield in the entire NFL one of the one of the, the like truest 50 50 splits in a backfield Javante Williams had a 50.49 percent opportunity share Melvin Gordon had a 51.49 percent opportunity share and those obviously add up to greater than 100 percent Javante Williams missed I think Javante missed a few games so it's not exactly 50 50 there um, but pretty much and the question we got to ask ourselves is, you know, he finishes the RB25 last year, like not even quite as an RB2, like as a, as a high RB3. Um, and people are now drafting him in the top five, top three running backs in Dynasty. Where can his opportunity share go with Melvin Gordon still on the team? And there were 25 running backs last year who had a higher opportunity share than both Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon's opportunity share was 26th in the league. So if we go through all of the guys who had a higher opportunity share and look at like what their opportunity share was, what the depth chart, like running back depth chart situation was on their team, we might be able to get a little bit of insight into like where this situation in Denver could shake out given what other situations in the league have looked like. And starting at the top, Najee Harris, 86.4% opportunity share, number one in the league. Behind him was just nothing, like Benny Snell, Anthony McFarland. Um, similar with Derrick Henry when he was healthy, 86% opportunity share. I probably won't list every number, but Derrick Henry, nothing really behind him. Like Dontrell Hilliard, um, Deontay Foreman came on when um, Henry went down. 
Um, and then there's Elijah Mitchell, just very blah behind him. Like Trey Sermon didn't end up being anything. Uh, Jeff Wilson is whatever. And then there's a couple guys in like David Montgomery, Dalvin Cook, who they have quality players behind them, but they're just like pure handcuffs. These guys aren't, you know, Khalil Herbert, Alex Madison. These guys aren't eating into the the workload much of Montgomery, of Cook when, when those two guys are healthy. So, and then we've got like Alvin Kamara, who also had just a bunch of blah behind him. Joe Mixon had a bunch of blah behind him. And then we've got the first guy here in Jonathan Taylor with a 70.8% opportunity share, who had another player on his team who had like a legitimate role, even when Taylor was healthy and playing well. Um, Naheem Hines was the satellite back there. He has like a legitimate role, um, that you could count on week in and week out. So that's, that's the first guy on this list we really see with another player who's like a significant part of this offense. And then we've got like Josh Jacobs, Austin Eckler, right around 69% opportunity share. Both of them just kind of blah behind them. Like Justin Jackson steps in when Austin Eckler's hurt, things like that. Kenyon Drake is, you know, kind of in the mix for, for, uh, Las Vegas, but not to the same, you know, kind of clear role degree that a guy like Naeem Hines is. And then we've got Leonard Fournette, who's a little bit different than those guys in that Ronald Jones wasn't really a handcuff um, and didn't really serve any sort of like specific like pass catching role or early down role or short yardage role. He was just kind of like the sidekick in this offense, in this backfield. Like Fournette was the main guy. And then there was like another dude who did spot duty in Ronald Jones. So I describe that situation as like a, a sidekick situation. Ronald Jones was the sidekick to Fournette. Um, then we've got James Robinson, who just had a bunch of blah behind him. Christian McCaffrey went healthy, just had a bunch of blah behind him. And then we've got Saquon Barkley, who he also had a sidekick um, in Devontae Booker, who, who was kind of also a handcuff. But when Saquon was healthy, um, it was fairly, um, not an even split, but like Saquon's opportunity share was 63%. So he wasn't, you know, handling a, a ton of this work. Booker was getting a good amount of it. I called that a sidekick situation. And then we've got Antonio Gibson, who played with JD McKissick. Um, that's another satellite back situation, um, kind of like Naeem Hines. Then we've got Daryl Henderson and Sony Michelle were kind of a true split. Daryl Henderson had 60% of the opportunity. Henderson is the last guy on this list with above a 60% opportunity share. These next four guys, Devin Singletary, James Conner, Nick Chubb, Ezekiel Elliott. I would describe all of their situations on their teams last season as being like the lead guy and then a sidekick. Singletary had Zach Moss. Uh, James Conner had Chase Edmonds. Nick Chubb had Kareem Hunt and then Dearness Johnson when Kareem Hunt missed time. Ezekiel Elliott had Tony Pollard, obviously. So there's there's four guys there between like 57 and 59% opportunity share who are like lead backs with sidekicks. And then we've got guys like Clyde Edwards Alaire, who is just kind of the leader of a committee. DeAndre Swift, where that was a pretty true split between him and Jamal Williams. Sony Michelle, I mentioned, um, splitting with Daryl Henderson. Michael Carter was kind of the lead of a committee. And then the last guy on this list um, is Aaron Jones, 52.7% opportunity share. And that was a pretty true split between him and AJ Dillon. So how does the Melvin Gordon, Javante Williams situation kind of shake out given what we've seen around the rest of the league. And in my opinion, the best, most realistic and kind of best case scenario outcome for Javante Williams, barring a Melvin Gordon injury, is that this situation becomes like a Javante as the as the lead guy and Melvin Gordon as the sidekick. I don't see, you know, there's a chance that this is the, this is just a true split again. Melvin Gordon was really good last year. He was slightly more efficient than Javante Williams on a per carry basis. Javante was a bit better as a receiver, but they were right there. Javante Williams was not clearly better than Melvin Gordon on the ground last year, and he was slightly worse. Like, they were both good. Melvin Gordon was a little bit better. So there's, I think there's a, a bigger chance than people want to believe that this is a 50-50 split again. But I would say that the most reasonable most likely outcome is that this turns into like a sidekick situation, like a, a Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, a, a Zeke Elliott and Tony Pollard, a James Conner and Chase Edmonds, a Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones, a situation where like Javante takes over, but Melvin Gordon is still heavily involved. I don't think there's much of a chance that this turns into like Javante is Dalvin Cook and Melvin Gordon is suddenly Alexander Madison. I don't really view that as a likely possibility here. And so I think this turns into a sidekick situation or a true split. You know, we had like Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones, Saquon Barkley and Devontae Booker. Those two situations topped out at 67% opportunity share for the lead back. Leonard Fournette had 67% of the opportunity share. But Leonard Fournette is like much better than Ronald Jones. Saquon Barkley is much better than Devontae Booker. We've already seen that Javante Williams and Melvin
Melvin Gordon are both good. The, the, the skill gap is very tight in Denver, and it's much more similar to like a Zeke and Tony Pollard, uh, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt situation, where these are like both really quality players with, with tight skill gaps, and those situations have topped out with opportunity shares for the lead back just below 60%. So what I did in kind of doing a, a quick projection here is I gave Javante Williams a 58.3% opportunity share in 2022, which I I based that off of just the average of James Conner, Nick Chubb, and Zeke, like what they had last season averaged together 58.3. So a 58.3% opportunity share. If the Denver offense didn't improve at all, same situation. We just kind of like copy and paste Denver's offensive efficiency and productivity from 2021 to 2022, except for the fact that Javante Williams now gets 58.3% of the opportunity instead of 50.49%. That would raise his points per game in PPR from 12.05 to 13.91, which would take him from RB25 on a points per game basis to RB20 on a points per game basis. I should also mention that this split with Melvin Gordon would mean, you know, that 58% opportunity share for Javante means that Melvin Gordon is going to max out at 41.7%, which would be lower than the opportunity shares for guys like Duke Johnson, Alex Collins, and Jamal Williams last year. I kind of think Melvin Gordon gets more than those guys got, but we're going best case scenario for Javante here, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep with it. That sort of opportunity share with Denver's offensive productivity from last season would see him finish as the RB20 in PPR points per game. But yes, we know that they added Russell Wilson. Like, the Broncos are going to be better next season than they were last season, in all likelihood. So what does that mean for what Javante Williams could do in fantasy? In 2021, they finished 31st in points and 26th in yards in the entire league. And if you take that amount of yards plus that amount of points and turn those into, like, fantasy points available on this team, they had 896.8 fantasy points available. I don't know how good that is, but it doesn't really matter. Probably not that good. In 2022, they've added Russell Wilson. So what does this offense turn into? I, I, I calculated based on a couple different outcomes. The first outcome is that this turns into a league average offense, which seems like a, you know, we're, we're shooting low here, but that would be a, a huge step forward for this offense. Like they were really bad last year. If they become league average, that's a big step up. So if they become a league average offense based on last season's like league average stats, that would give them 975 fantasy points available in the offense. And based on the opportunity share we're giving Javante Williams, that would give him 15.12 PPR points per game and an RB13 finish. That's a little bit better. If this turns into a top 10 offense, which would give the Broncos 1,071 fantasy points available, based on his opportunity share that we're giving him, Javante Williams would then have 16.55 PPR points per game, and an RB9 finish on a points per game basis. A little bit better. If they become a top five offense, you know, like a, a Buffalo Bills, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Los Angeles Chargers level offense, like really, really good, they would have 1,123 fantasy points available. Javante Williams would end up, based on his opportunity share, with 17.39 points per game and an RB8 finish. So, you know, RB, RB9 was top 10 offense. RB8 comes with the top five offense, we don't see a large jump here between top 10 offense to top five offense. So I think we're seeing sort of diminishing returns the, the better we project the Broncos to be. A top 10 offense would be a big win. Top five offense is a little bit better, but it doesn't represent that much of a gap. So, and if they become the best offense in the league, and I believe it was Dallas last year who scored the number one points in the league, had the most had the most yards in the league. So if they, if they just replicate what Dallas did last year, that would represent 1,222 fantasy points available. Javante, with a 58.3% opportunity share, would then score 18.92 points per game and would put him as the RB4 in fantasy based on finishes from 2021. So what does all of that mean? Originally, when I did this research, I assumed that these projections I was making would indicate that like there wasn't much room to grow for Javante Williams, even given like a sidekick type role for Melvin Gordon, a lead back role for Javante Williams, even given an increase in offensive efficiency and productivity with Russell Wilson. I assumed that there wasn't much room to grow, and I think I proved myself wrong here. Like, he could get anywhere from, you know, RB20 to RB8 or 9 um, based on this opportunity share, and that doesn't even account for, like, the chance that he's just a more efficient runner this year, given, you know, defense is giving more respect to the passing game and Russell Wilson back there. There's, you know, bigger lanes to run through. So there's, there's upside here. And so situationally, like, 
I get it. I get why people are in on Javante Williams. There's opportunity here for him to put Melvin Gordon on the bench a little bit more than he was last season. There's opportunity for him to step into, you know, just a better offensive situation with Russell Wilson in charge. Like, I get it. I also think that the difference in my opinion and everybody else's opinion, well, maybe not everybody else, but like, there are these people who are just all about Javante Williams. They were all about Javante Williams, drafting him as the RB2 in Dynasty before Russell Wilson was even on the team. And so... I know that these people were not projecting offensive steps forward like this for the Broncos for Javante Williams in the absence of Melvin Gordon. That was just an opportunity-based projection. Melvin Gordon's back. Now it's got to be an efficiency-based projection. And so I think the difference here between the way I look at it and the way that a lot of other people, a lot of Javante Williams, you know, truthers are looking at it is philosophical. I think my philosophy is that in Dynasty, I want to take shots on the players that I think are the most talented and not necessarily the players who find themselves in the best situations. If I'm taking a running back top five in Dynasty, I want him to be close to a top five actual talent. And while I think Javante Williams is a really good player, I think he's probably closer to a top 20 talent as far as running backs in the league go than he is a top five talent, which is still really good. Like that's where I would have had like prime David Montgomery or like Rashad Penny currently is probably a top 20 running back in the league. Prime Lamar Miller was a top 20 running back in the league. These are guys who I view as having like not necessarily comparable skill sets. I think Montgomery is fairly comparable to Javante Williams, but comparable levels of talent. Like I'm not saying Javante Williams is a similar player to Lamar Miller. I think he's a similar talented player to Lamar Miller. And I don't want to bet on guys in Dynasty to like rely on situational factors to outperform their talent level in Dynasty. And I guess I'm making claims about his talent here. I'll try to back them up a little bit. Um, That's not really what this video is about. But Javante Williams, going back since high school, like his first year in college, he was like the fourth option at North Carolina, was not efficient relative to the other guys on the team. Uh, His second year in North Carolina, he split time pretty much 50-50 with Michael Carter, was not efficient relative to what Michael Carter was doing, even when we account for the fact that Javante Williams was seeing heavier box counts than Michael Carter saw. The third year um, at North Carolina, second year splitting time with Michael Carter, basically the same situation, not efficient relative to what Michael Carter's output was on a per carry basis, even when considering that... Javante Williams was seeing heavier box counts. And then last year with Melvin Gordon, a true 50-50 split, he was catching more passes, being slightly more efficient through the air, but he was not more efficient on a per carry basis than Melvin Gordon was, even accounting for the difference in box counts. So there's just a lot of projection involved in saying that like, we're confident that Melvin Gordon is one of the few best running backs in the league because he's never even been the best ball carrier on his team going back to college. And so I believe he's good, I don't believe he's elite, and I don't want to take a guy at the one-two turn in a dynasty startup because he's in a good situation without him being an elite player. His talent is less fungible than his situation is. We didn't expect them to trade for Russell Wilson. We didn't expect them to re-sign Melvin Gordon. Who knows what hap- what unexpected thing happens next, but we know what kind of player Javante Williams is, or at least we think we do. Everybody has different opinions on what that is, but we at least have a take of what Javante Williams is and the kind of player that he is, is not going to suddenly change. He's not going to suddenly turn into Christian McCaffrey. He's not going to suddenly turn into Jordan Howard. He is what he is. And however good you think that is, that's what he is. His situation is what it is as well, but it has much more potential to be something completely different tomorrow or next year or the year after that. And so while I get the short-term situational upside that this team, this offense gives Javante Williams, I'm not willing to invest that highly just given that I don't think his talent justifies it. The other part of this discussion is that the running back landscape in Dynasty right now is just not very good. There's like Jonathan Taylor at the very top who's young, elite, locked into a role. He's obviously the 101. And then there's like Najee Harris, DeAndre Swift, who are young-ish. Najee Harris is a little bit older, um, but talented guys on uh, iffy situations, but who are probably going to get volume, probably going to be good. Beyond that, all of the other guys in Dynasty right now, the higher end guys are like 26, 27 years old. And so Javante Williams, I understand why people want to slot him in like right behind Najee Harris, right behind Jonathan Taylor, right there with DeAndre Swift, given that the other options are all older. Like he, he kind of straddles the line between like, we know that these young guys are good and we know that these older guys are good. Here's a young guy that we think is really good. And so like, we'll put him right here. And so I understand 
ranking him there in the running back rankings. And I, I, I think I've realized that I don't really have a problem with that um, based on this research. But I'm just not taking running back where he's going in the draft. Like, the running back landscape is not good in Dynasty right now. You don't have to take a running back at the 1-2 turn. Like, you just, you don't have to do it. You can pivot off of Javante Williams. You can pivot off of Austin Eckler and take receiver, trade back. You can do other things with your picks than taking Javante Williams as the RB4. And so that, I think, is the move here. Not necessarily that he should be the RB9 instead or the RB8 instead. Like, that's not really my take. My take is, okay, I get why he is where he is in the running back rank. I'm probably just not willing to take him there anyway, given what else I can do with my roster. So that's my take on Javante Williams. Um, I don't know how actionable that is. Fairly informative for me, at least. I don't know if this is helpful for anybody else, but I'm glad I did this research and kind of thought my way through that. But I want this to be like an actionable video. And so I'm I'm tossing on a, a quick Leonard Fournette take at the end. So I've kind of decided that Javante Williams is properly rated mostly perhaps slightly overrated as far as running backs go, um, or as far as his talent in a vacuum goes. I think he's slightly less talented than everybody else seems to think he is, but for the most part, properly rated. Leonard Fournette now, underrated in Dynasty. And basically, where I've drawn this conclusion is, if we look at the that, that tier of running backs that I've identified as, you know, 26, 27-year-old guys, you know, been around for a while, have been productive and good. Basically, those guys are Austin Eckler, Alvin Kamara, Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook, Nick Chubb, Saquon Barkley, Christian McCaffrey, and Leonard Fournette. Leonard Fournette is being drafted after every single one of them in Dynasty, like by far, like 30 picks after the next latest guy. But in 2021, he averaged the second highest points per game among them. There was Austin Eckler at the top with 21.5 points per game, and then it was Leonard Fournette at 18.26, then Christian McCaffrey at 18.21, and then kind of, you know, Kamara, Mixon, uh, Cook, Chubb, Saquon. So Leonard Fournette was the second best among these guys last year, and he's basically the same age as all of them. Starting in, you know, when the season starts in September, Austin Eckler will be 27, Alvin Kamara will be 27, Dalvin Cook will be 27, Leonard Fournette will be 27. There's not a large difference in age here. He's also you know, within a year of Joe Mixon, within a year of Chubb, barely a year older than, than Christian McCaffrey. These guys are all comparable ages. And so if age is the reason why Leonard Fournette is being faded in Dynasty, then these other guys equally need to be faded in Dynasty. And recent productivity can't be the reason he's being faded in Dynasty because he was better than 90% of these guys were last season. And so he's a similar age. He was better than them last year. He's in... He's on the same team he was on with Tom Brady. He was a good runner last year. His box-adjusted efficiency rating, which measures his per-carry output relative to the other guys on the team, given the box counts he's seeing, was in the 59th percentile. His relative success rate, which measures how often is he succeeding on his carries, given down in distance, given the box counts he's seeing relative to the other guys on his team, was in the 55th percentile. So he's been still an above-average runner at this point in his career. He saw the third-most targets in the league among running backs last season, despite missing three games, and he's on an offense that finished second in points, second in yards, and his sidekick, Ronald Jones, is now gone. They added Rashad White in the draft, who I think is better than Ronald Jones, but we don't know what his role looks like. Maybe he's the satellite back, maybe he steps in and replicates the Ronald Jones role, we don't really know, but Leonard Fournette is still here on a great team and was playing well last season and is the same age as all of these guys in Dynasty. Christian McCaffrey's being taken as the 7th player off the board in Dynasty right now. Austin Eckler is being taken as the 23rd player off the board. Kamara's being taken 25th, Mixon 24th, Cook 27th, Chubb 26th, Saquon 24th. Leonard Fournette's taken as the 58th player off the board right now. There's almost no reason why he shouldn't be part of this tier because he is from a quality standpoint, but from, but from a valuation standpoint, from a, an ADP standpoint, I see no reason why he shouldn't be taken in the Nick Chubb, Dalvin Cook, you know, Saquon range when he's just as good as those guys from a fantasy perspective. He's still good from like a real life per touch perspective, and he's in a good situation. So Leonard Fournette is a screaming buy for me in Dynasty. He's a win now asset that can be had much later in the draft than a lot of these other guys who are also just win now assets. You got to buy Leonard Fournette. Do whatever you want with Javante Williams, I guess, because I concluded that he's properly rated, if not slightly overrated. But yeah, that's the video. Kind of rambling, I guess, but I think, you know, maybe some useful information. Thanks for sticking around. Yeah, I don't know. Hit like, hit subscribe, leave a comment. Tell me that Javante Williams is really good and that Leonard Fournette is bad. And Rashad White's going to take all his, you know, Rashad White's going to take his job. And that's why I'm dumb. So thanks for watching the video. Uh, catch me. When is this one coming out? Like Sunday? Yeah. Catch me next Wednesday. Peace. <laughs>